Welcome everyone to uh, this episode of Ascend TV, Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. And I'm Will Burning. Mm -hmm. And today our program is Autism and Filmmaking with our guests Peter Kangas and Josiah Polemus. But before we begin, Will, what's with your shirt now? Funny you should ask. This for our last episode, I'm for our last episode of the year, I'm wearing my Christmas sweater to, to celebrate the holidays. Uh, I, I wear this I wear this this year every Christmas and I encourage everyone to 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 buy or wear their Christmas sweaters and so they to, to get so they can get into the holiday spirit. Thank you, Will. Would you like to begin with our guest? Gladly. Tell us about your tell us about your film that you're making. Well, that's a great question. Uh, it's a semi-autobiographical film that was written by Josiah and I, and uh, I'm directing it as well. And it covers not necessarily uh, all aspects, but specifically, well, that's not fair to say. It covers the aspects of autism in the uh, film and entertainment industry, but also it's a very deep and personal story about my life and how going about my life has been very strong not necessarily strong. So basically, we're we're telling Peter's story. Um, our movie is called Evergreen and the Effing Spectrum, and the idea is that we're showing the contrast between what it's like to be on the spectrum from Peter's perspective versus the sort of Hollywood mainstream version that he sees depicted in a film within our film. And uh, so we've written a screenplay together and um, gone through many drafts of it and um, but getting to those drafts were really tough by trying to depict this properly an authentic representation which is what we're trying to do which I couldn't find my words to earlier <laughs> thank you for that um, but yeah we're trying to show it in an authentic three-dimensional way instead of a two-dimensional way that's been done before and some of the process has been really cathartic and really difficult but there's been so much beauty with Josiah helping along the entire way as well which has been great and as he said, we've got a full screenplay done, and we've got uh, people interested in well, or interested in it as well. And someone also uh, said that it potential to be groundbreaking. Yeah, we've we've gotten some really amazing feedback on it. So uh, we've shown it to different people in the industry, and uh, definitely one of the quotes was groundbreaking. Um, um, many have been, "This is original. I've never read a script like this." Um, and there's been a lot of interest, so uh, we're very excited about that because the whole point is to show more stories like this uh, around what is it like to um, be on the spectrum from the perspective of, of someone, someone on the spectrum as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. I made the jump. Yeah. Yeah. Who is Peter? <laughs> <laughs> Which I was saying before, it, it's taken a lot of strength and it's a really strong story and screenplay, but it's also taken a lot of courage and strength as well to tell that story and going over some of those deep personal issues that not only I deal with, but I'm sure everybody in this world deals with every single day, which I couldn't find the words to earlier. How did you come to filmmaking? Uh, I, at 11 years old, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I walked into the skate shop and I saw this film called Logic 11 on the screen and it just had this nice low angle wide shot of someone filming someone skateboarding and I was like that's what I wanted to do and so then I uh, at 18 I dropped out of high school I moved to Los Angeles I started taking classes at Santa Monica College and then from that I just started taking other gigs and jobs and whatnot and then I moved up here in 2014 went to Futures at 2017 then left with Josiah in 2019 yeah, so Futures Explorers a film school, um, and Peter and I met there. I was an instructor there, and um, the way that this script came about is Peter and I, uh, well, Peter was in a class. History of Disability. Yeah. That was it. And I was walking by. I heard this person sharing about things that had happened to them in their life, and I thought, I've never seen that depicted in a film. You know, when you see these uh, films that... You know, if you think of a movie like Rain Man. Or Forrest Gump. First of all, you have this gaze of looking at this person objectively, not through their eyes, but someone else kind of looking at them. And and there's this kind of cliche thing about it. And I, you know, my thought was like, what? I wish I could just see Peter's story on the screen where he's dealing with real life issues, but he happens to be, you know, neurodiverse. He happens to be on the spectrum. And so I asked him if he'd be interested in, you know, sharing and writing about his his um, 
his life and, mm-hmm. and if we could turn it into a screenplay, just even as a challenge and maybe even as a little bit of therapy for Peter or for people. Oh, totally. You know, <laughs> for sure. For right? sure. So for sure. so we were just trying that first, you know, just like, let's just see if we can write a screenplay. Yeah. And there's a lot of content to put down first, too, with all the stories. And then you have to take your beats within the screenplay itself, which are 40. And then you have to just start marking down everything that's relevant and then also Hollywoodizing it, which is what your thought was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Hollywoodizing, I guess. It's, it's, a, it's a interesting term. I guess for what it means is like can it appeal to as many people as possible can yeah, you can much. you reach is it a relatable many? story to everybody in the world not necessarily one particular audience yeah i mean even though that is the goal to mm-hmm. include the autism community but the neurodiverse community it's more so of like let's try to make it to a whole global audience mm-hmm. everyone that can relate to it and sympathize and empathize and just identify with and when we were writing it you know we were sort of like i was sort of questioning Peter from the, um, you know, neurotypical idea of like, oh, uh, you know, like, well, how does this feel to you? Or what would this be like? And so that's how we would write about it. And Peter would talk about how it actually felt to him. And we thought, well, let's just visually try to represent yeah. that and show that. Get in the mind of it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's, it's Peter's story. Like he shared about him just now about, you know, getting the camera when he's 11 and um, having an instant interest, and we have that in our film. We sh- we show the young. It's meta. It's a little meta. Yeah, it's very meta. <laughs> it's a little meta. <laughs> so, tell us about the filmmaking process. It's a lengthy one, but it uh, it all starts on the page, and if it's not on the page, it's not on the stage. That's a big <laughs> one. Um, but then it it just can't, it started with the story of being at Futures. Your life. Yeah, that I guess. (laughs) And then it went from that to Josiah helping me identify with my autism, but not necessarily the autism, but being a human first with an ability, but more so accommodate that, which was, you know, giving me a voice, giving me to be able to identify with myself and my stories of my life, which has to do with family, love, relationships, and then also some, you know, very private issues around things with the love of my life and whatnot that I'm sure other people have been through mm-hmm. that I want to, I don't want to ruin the story, the plot. But uh, I mean, what else would you say? Well, just, you know, we're dealing with some life issues of relationships, you know, things being messy. And, you know, I feel like sometimes these stories are are told in very preciously and, oh, this person's a little angel mm-hmm. and they can do no wrong. And, you know, they taught me something about me, you know, that <laughs> little cliche, you know, yeah. and it's like we wanted to break that and say, like, no, this person may may not teach me anything, Which, but but they're but they are a human being that is going through what I'm going through. But they also have to deal with yeah you know being on the spectrum and what what and navigating that. that whole thing too so we just wanted to show some of that and we show some of it comedically obviously dramatically as well very dramatically yeah i mean it's a drama with with comedic elements for sure um and some surreal elements too um but it also comes back down to the whole thing of uh the concept of what we're trying to do here we're trying to make sure that people can identify with themselves and their their autism before being referred to the secondary of what television and film has put Mm -hmm. out for all these years that's misrepresenting and mis uh misleading the actual Mm -hmm. audience and people you know like viewers yeah like you and me that just watch it and are like you know yeah and i'll I'll just say we the question was like where did you get started with filmmaking i also was like peter like i loved film from a from the start. 16, actor. He wanted to be an actor. He told me that. Oh, probably even earlier. Earlier? Like five. Sorry. <laughs> I think I just wanted to be in front of the camera at first, and then later I wanted to be behind the camera. So, Where are you in the development and production of the film? We are currently in pre-production. So there, there are five steps, which is development, pre-production, production, which is principal photography, mm-hmm. which you actually go out, shoot the film, post-production, and distribution, and mm-hmm. distribution is king. And right now we just finished uh, pitching the film to several people at the Ethos Film Festival in Los Angeles, which Josiah actually made a film called First X mm-hmm. about uh, Nicole Adler and her first kiss and love and family. Well, not necessarily family, but it, it covers all of that. But uh, essentially we are in, sorry, we are in pre-production right now and we are exploring the best way to get support, which, you know, we, we'd love support any way in any capacity possible and whatnot, but more so we're exploring what the best way to get this film made can possibly be. 
Yeah, we've had people who are interested in reading the script. Obviously, that's our, our main thing is get people to read the script. Most yeah. everyone that's read the script, I shouldn't even say most everyone, everyone that's read the script has responded positively mm -hmm. to it, which makes us realize we have something really um, special here. So um, so we're getting it out to producers. We pitched it, as, as Peter said, um, at the Ethos International Film Festival. And we had uh, several people who wanted to then read the script. So that's that's what we're up to mm -hmm. is getting people And get on the board. pitch deck edited too. Sorry. And we have what's called a pitch deck. A pitch deck is something that most people know. But if you don't, it's basically a lot of pictures and um, a, a kind of quick at maybe advertisement for your film. Or like promotion. Ten, ten mm. pages that sort of show like, well, here's, you know, here's some characters. Here's the plot. Here's the here's, synopsis, and here's why it's relevant and important. Uh, I'd like to follow up with what you were talking about earlier about the sort of the Hollywoodization of autistic portrayals, or as you put in it earlier, like the 2D approach previously that you're working on to develop into a 3D. Sure. Yeah, can you tell us about that? Okay, well, you. I, I'll just I'll, I'll get I'll get the construction I'll yeah. get the base going. Uh, so yeah, so. So 2D, you take a character like uh, Dustin Hoffman's character in Rayman, and you just have that blanket just character with no depth, no nothing, that's saved by the common do-gooder, which is mm -hmm. Tom Cruise's character, to kind of do that, that kind of, it's almost like a buddy love film of like where you care about this person, but it's we don't really care too much about the character. It's Tom Cruise's character that we actually mm -hmm. care about. And so he's being saved and kind of dra drug along. What we're doing here is we're using someone on the spectrum written by someone who actually that gives the authenticity right there and the represent representation by default. And then you take that and you lead that in with these actual life experiences that actually happen in an mm -hmm. authentic way that's not taken from a third party screenwriter even though Rain Man was based on someone on the spectrum from, it still mm -hmm. didn't come from that person individually. Right. Sorry. Yeah. And also, you know, if you take a character like Forrest Gump, where you know you don't know what his what's going on with him, but you was that there's an assumption that there's something, you know, different about him, and um, it's based on caricature mostly yeah. instead of. And, and uh, you know, so it's it's like you you kind of assume he has some sort of mental disability but is never s spoken but that's sort of this cliche of like oh this character has to be you know always treated with kid gloves and um you know i mean these are two you know the movies we we talked about they those are award-winning movies <laughs> yeah but it's like we think we can do one better we can we do think, better okay. we think we, we can, need to start we can make it more three-dimensional from coming from the actual perspective of the person and and with the goal of having someone on the spectrum play that character. On the spectrum. Yeah. It's my impression, just as a, a movie and TV observer, that over the years that has improved and that I felt I've seen some examples of more 3D characterizations of uh, characters. Do you have any ones that you could say are good examples that you would like to perhaps build upon and exceed as far as their depth? That's a great question. Well, I mean, there's a uh, the show I can't add. Uh, I think it's Josh Thomas. Everything is going to be yeah, okay. All, all or, right, okay. Yeah, I mean, I've time. seen that show a few times. I, I know, um, what's her name? Cromer. Uh, Kayla Cromer, I was, I was going to say. Yeah, so she... She She's come out, out mm -hmm. in, in a very brave way and been said, like, I'm on the spectrum and I'm playing a character on the spectrum in this show. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the first times I've ever seen that happen. We're, we're talking about making a feature film, which I haven't actually seen a feature film where that's happened. Indeed. Except uh, the accountant where Ben Affleck's character said, I have a high function form of autism. But then there's all these other films that have tried, but, you know, flopped or not done it. That's a neurotypical actor playing a, a character who's on the spectrum. And not that we're totally opposed to that in mm -hmm. our film. It's more that we just want to make sure we have inclusion in the film. So we will do a casting and look for the best actor. And the idea, you know, there's there's this, like our, our character, he's, he's different ages throughout. So... But hopefully he can play the uh, the role of Paul and give it the give us that performance, or mm -hmm. else we have to recast and use somebody 
of the caliber to do that. But hopefully that will then encourage others to come out and be more, have more strength to come out and try acting and really identify with themselves mm -hmm. and be yeah. in front of the screen instead of behind because they're worried about their image or not being able to identify or some type of critical, you know, response. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we always want to make sure there's a, a opportunity for people to do this. And then finally, just to say that ideally we would get to the point where you didn't even worry about whether someone was on the spectrum or not on the spectrum. You're just hiring anybody to play any role yeah. in your film. So that's I, that's a kind of our ideal um, with this film is like, well, maybe someone who's neurodiverse will play someone who's supposed to be neurotypical in the mm -hmm. film and someone who's neurotypical will play that's someone awesome. neurodiverse yes. in the film. As long as we're showing a lot of representation, you know, giving actual opportunities to people um, who identify as being on the spectrum in this film. What is your advice to people who want to go into filmmaking? Can, can I? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, uh, this is interesting because this is actually in the, uh, in, the, uh, in the screenplay. Kurosawa, great filmmaker, studied him in film school. He had some advice for upcoming filmmakers and it was simply write scripts. All you need is a pencil and paper to just start writing and that's literally what just Josiah and I did. We just started, we went to the kitchen at Futures, the, uh, the uh, no, it was Keith, the I forget exactly, sorry, my apologies, but he said, go in the kitchen and just start writing all this out and we did and we started just writing out all these ideas and it all started on the page. And I'd say that, you know, start writing down your experiences, make a journal, a diary, or just write down what a screenplay of your daily life of what happened. Oh, you walked out, you know, interior house. I got my clothes on and I got ready to go for the day. You know, you throw in this action, you throw in this, you know, dialogue, you talk to your parents and just start practicing there. And then go from there to your day to, you know, a week to a month to a year, whatever. I mean, I asked Peter when we were when I heard about his, you know, life back in that class. Um, I said, well, you know, how does it feel when you're going through this, right? So when we were writing the script, he said, you know, he said, like, well, it feels like people are just like they're in my mind. There's these people bombarding, like, there's all these people bombarding me with questions, sort of, you know, as a metaphor for like how it feels sometimes when he's um, overwhelmed with something. So we thought, well, how can we visualize that? Oh, well will have a representation of his mind in the film. And, Which is a great framework, by the way. And, and it, you should and talk it works it. as, a, you know, like a press conference. So we're in the character's mind, and he's being bombarded with questions from a press conference. But as it turns out, all those characters represent a past memory or trauma from his life. And in the film, we see him sort of like tackle each question as he's trying to, you know, guide through his whole life on the spectrum, basically, yeah. and even to the present day. Would you say uh, anyone you've worked with, you know, cast members, even crews that um, on and off set that have they become more comfortable letting their inhibitions grow while defending their character? I mean, whether they they have or not, I mean, I would they, say, yeah. yeah, I mean, going back to futures, I'm not. I, I, Okay, I'll jump into a little bit of a story. Is that all right? Please, yeah. So we were doing a we were doing a short called Mystery Assassin, and, and I was the uh, director of photography, and our actor was having trouble with the lines. And tell uh -huh. me if this is ex where you're going with this. That uh -huh. uh, she was filming her lines, and the the head cinematographer Frank, who was kind of our you know the mentor behind the scenes, helping us hands on visual, he uh, was like one setup, eight takes, and we didn't get the shot. And our uh, actress Shannon, she was she was having really tr a big trouble with that. So Josiah pulled her aside and started working one on one with her while we were uh, cleaning up the set, and then also in the morning before we got the set as well when she was called. Uh, you want to tell a little more about that? Well, just the experience of that actor getting a little more hands on, a little more patience around, you know being understood and what she maybe was going through helped her to eventually deliver this performance. And uh, that set was all inclusive and yeah, there's a lot of, there's a difference in this set that's what I consider all inclusive because there's so it's much more patience. There's tone. more. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a quality that makes it almost like a, an ideal set, an ideal crew. 
there's a understanding that you know everyone has a role there's an understanding that people might need help or extra uh-huh. time is a big and, one would portrayal be just as important you know not just knowing the lines i mean true but um would you say and the and the performance and the yeah, action yeah absolutely yeah. but it also comes down to would you agree with the with the actor in that role of how comfortable they are with getting that deep i think you know that's... rehearsal is rehearsal yeah. is rehearsal so you know coming from an acting background definitely re- yeah. regardless of who you are you need time with the material yes and you need time to sort of even daydream about the, the, the thoughts that come to you around that character to do something authentic, I think. Yeah. You know, to really show yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Besides doing background to, you know, important, you know, background of the character. Oh, uh, yeah. The yeah. depth, who the character really is, you yeah. know, what their flaws, what their uh, ambitions are, uh-huh. their pros and cons, you know, vulnerabilities, stuff like that. Absolutely, yeah. for sure. Yeah, Thank in you. in the in in film, you don't get too much time to rehearse, so you you yeah. look forward to the actor doing the kind of prep you're talking about beforehand, and hoping they have, yeah. so that we don't have this situation we had where you have to like on the fly start <laughs> to rehearse. Thank you again, Jennifer Brooks. I understand that you are actually involved in the creative process as far as a play. Would you like to discuss that with our guests? Um. Oh, sure. The play is still in the, I guess, what you could call the pre-pre-pre-production yeah. stage, and it's actually been on ice for several months, and I'm actually hoping the two of you could help me change that status and move it along a little bit. Of course. It's Pretty about well. a girl in sixth grade. She's on the autism spectrum. It's her story, and she has to deal with the day-to-day challenges of being a sixth grade girl. If you've ever been a sixth grade girl, you know that <laughs> you know what that's like. Middle school's tough. And she also has to decide if for the following school year she wants to transfer to the regular junior high school with everybody else from her class so that she can be with the people that she knows, or if she wants to go to a special school designed specifically for children with autism where she doesn't know anybody. So it's quite a dilemma. I have submitted it to several uh, developmental workshops and contests. It's always been rejected. They keep pointing out flaws like the characters are too one dimensional. Mm. The kids talk like adults. They're supposed to be in sixth grade. And yeah, the ending is too abrupt. The story's not dramatic enough. So right now it's in its second version, but I don't really know how to address the criticisms that I've gotten and make it performable. Well, we've done some rewrites, right? Yeah, there's how, there's how many, you guys. <laughs> how many rewrites did we do on our, our uh, feature film? The first one uh, was four, actually five, I five, think. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then within that, which We'd be happy to put you in touch with. Uh, for every draft of the screenplay comes coverage, which is done by a story consultant. And then they give you feedback on how you can make it better and whatnot, which it sounds what you got, but it was really harsh. But yeah, uh, five drafts and then two others with the uh, with the with the other project too. So yeah, we're so so the idea is that rewrites are definitely part of the process. So don't give up on the first draft, and. It, getting getting feedback and criticism from anyone is always hard, always. Yeah. It's so ne- it never gets easier. Don't take it personally, and um, and keep going. Like like tell Bite your, your story. Bite your tongue, swallow your pride, and you will make it. Tell each t- time. Tell that story because that's a story we haven't heard either. I was about. We to have say. not heard that story, so please tell it. Thank you, Jennifer. We'll now hear again from Stacy Kennedy regarding the cultural report. Hello, everybody. Uh, Happy holidays. Uh, Today, my uh, cultural report, I'm going to share a couple things from that's happening under the Ascend website. Uh, December 9th, which is Saturday, a general meeting will take place on Zoom, 10 a.m. The meeting will be on employment is the gaming industry. And we will be joined by speakers, Pamela Cosman, and Leanne 
Chikovsky, who are professors from UC San Diego and Northeastern who have been doing cutting edge research and testing on jobs with adults, for adults with autism. And um, in the gaming industry, they also have been testing the, u the use of games and virtual reality to assist adults with autism to gain work skills and social skills. They will be interviewed by our job club facilitator, Michael Burnett, Saturday, December 16th, holiday party at the Ark of San Francisco, 1500 Howard Street, 11th Street. Um, and that will start at one, it'll go till four, p.m. in the afternoon and you are to please come and join our community for food conversation music and good cheer and there will be entertainment music games and did we mention food <laughs> um it'd be great if you could bring your own it's a potluck but if you don't show up anyways um one last thing um from autismsociety.org Sunday, December 10th, will be the um, accessible Sunday Christmas in the park. Starting at 10 a.m., there will be um, a, a free event for those with special needs at the Plaza de Cesar Chavez, um, and their families are welcomed, sponsored by Galita and TJ Rogers, it seems to be. Uh, this offers community groups a, a chance to um, network and give great opportunity to promote their resources and programs and um you can purchase a table i believe that's the one thing that isn't free uh but if you want a table because it's a resource fair uh you must uh talk to you would go to autismsociety.org um and talk to them but this happens in san francisco there will be a sensory santa and story hour and book uh giveaways and a snow machine so uh, that is it for me. And again, happy holidays. Thanks. Thank you again, Stacy. Finally, we'll hear from Jennifer Brooks, our book correspondent with a new book review. Uh, hello, everybody, and happy holidays. Hope it's a safe and joyous one for all of you. The book I'd like to tell you about today has a title that uh, any of us on the spectrum may not like, simply because we've heard it so many times and we're so tired of hearing it. It is titled, But You Don't Look Autistic At All, by a woman named Bianca Topes. So, viewers at home, what do you think? Does she look autistic? Well, what exactly is an autistic person supposed to look like anyway? Um, she doesn't devote the entirety of the book to and talking about that. She tells her own life story, which is quite interesting. She was born in 1984, four years after I was, and she received her diagnosis at the age of 25 which is right about the same time I was diagnosed, because I was diagnosed at the age of 30 in 2010. And um, also interesting is that this woman is from the Netherlands. Uh, yes, kids, there are autistic people in the Netherlands. There are autistic people in every country. So she starts off the book by discussing a little bit about the history of autism and some of the wrong ideas that people have come up with over the years that sadly have not entirely disappeared and she also believes that even today in this supposedly more enlightened era we also have we still have a lot of wrong ideas about autism primarily because the ideas are being come up are being thought of by academics with phds who don't have any actual experience interacting with people on the spectrum outside of their labs where they experiment on people, which is not good. Thank you, Jennifer. Well, everyone, that is our program for this week of Send TV Life on the Autism Spectrum. I'm your co-host, Keith Halperin. I'm Will Burnick. I'm Stacey Kennedy. I'm Jennifer Brooks. I'm Peter Kangas. I'm Josiah Paul Hemus. Mm -hmm. And until next time, everyone, Stay well and a happy holiday season to one and all. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye.